thank you all for coming. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. And thank you, Howard, for being here as well. Uh, folks, during my uh, fireside chat with Howard, I'm actually going to carry a cell phone, and you're not going to be able to drink if my daughter calls uh, or anything. I can't buy you those drinks. But I'll be following the Twitter feed. So if you have questions for Howard, I apologize for some of you that uh, uh, don't, aren't into the Twitter thing. Fire them away at us, and I'll, uh, I'll actually peek every once in a while when I'm going off topic to see if there's a, a question from the audience uh, from, uh, on Twitter uh, for Howard to deal with. So once again, Howard, thanks for being here. Uh, it's, the, it's great to be here. <laughs> I mean, I just I want to go around and hug everybody and, and the people like I didn't get to see last night. So thanks so much for the invitation. As you're aware, the, the theme of this conference is embracing change in the new world. And uh, as one of our uh, esteemed veterans in the information security profession, what I'd love to hear is, uh, you know, a background in the U.S. Air Force, a background as a, as a street cop on the streets of Arizona, then moving on to Microsoft and industry and the like, and then, of course, into government service. What types of changes throughout your career have you uh, noticed, and, and how has it affected you personally and your understanding of the profession? Yeah, I think the last piece about how it's affected me personally is, is a tremendous deep respect and appreciation for what everybody in this room does. Uh, you know, I, I was doing some, some press thing this morning, and the question was, you know, what about this, what about that? And I go, wait a minute, the machine runs. And the machine runs, it's not easy. You guys know better than anybody else, but day after day after day, we still can do the things that we want to do. There's disruptions, but it's because of the work that you guys are doing. And so that, I think, is, is the most profound change that I've had uh, and was recognized when I was at the White House this last time. It's, People were talking about all these other things, and I said, wait a minute, the people that are doing the real work are the one that making this thing work, not some piece of legislation or somebody's uh, uh, report they did. Now, as far as the change, it's really interesting, because you look back to the early days, and, and I know many of you remember back the days where bulletin board systems and Carter sites, and then it was, you know, it was a 300 baud modem and a green screen, you can actually, the characters had to catch up to your typing, it was that bad. Uh, but we still had hackers then. We had people interfering with traffic control systems because they could. Maintenance ports on some of the early uh, uh, Multic systems and some of the other things we had out there. I mean, it was pretty limited. Uh, not only was it limited to what we were trying to protect, but we didn't have the highly trained law enforcement to deal with these cases that we have today, which is why some of us got into this. We didn't have corporate recognition that these things were even going on. Uh, you know, so, so that was sort of that piece of it. Then, and I think, and probably most of us agree, in 1994 when the web became sort of the thing for the public, and uh, I remember the, uh, I think it was the Internet Liberation Front uh, was really, you know, started going after systems. This when I was with uh, Air Force OSI, because they felt that the Internet was being commercialized, and it should be used for what it was used before, that, you know, to send emails and do research and stuff. And that was sort of the first disruption type folks, writing pieces of malware that I remember. But it was very limited. Uh, you know, we, I don't think we ever found out how, how many or who they were, but they were doing that and looking to disrupt because they want the internet to be free of commercialism. Well, look at us today. Uh, I think just last holiday season, there was a 17% increase of online shopping to the tune of about $26 billion. And when you look at overall what the economy was both last year and the year before, I mean, that's phenomenal. Uh, and I think that speaks volumes to the change that we've seen in that, the dependency we have. I think the, the, the last big change uh, that we've seen is, is our tremendous dependency on this. You mentioned your mobile device and, and, and people, you know, tweeting through everything from court cases to congressional meetings to having dinner with their friends. Uh, it's no longer that it's just something nice to have. We depend on this. Uh, I was telling uh, 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 some folks last night about you know, my experience getting here last night. And, and you know you're about to have a bad flight when it's five minutes before you're supposed to depart. The gate agent makes the announcement that the pilots were on time and the pilots coming from gate C3, you're at gate C7. It's five minutes to departure and there's no plane there. That's the first clue that there's something not going well. The, uh, then about 20 minutes later, the plane shows up, deplanes, and the pilot's still missing, which then makes people wonder, if he can't get from gate C3 to C7, how are we going to get to Orange County? 
And then the third thing, which you really know things were getting tough, is when you're taxi out, you're sitting on the runway, and he says, and you hear somebody say, does anybody have any jumper cables? <laughs> and I love the sense of humor of some of the flight attendants, but the pilot comes on and says, by the way, we can't start the left engine, so we're going back to the gate. And so that sort of illustrates, and what happens, as soon as that happens, everybody starts grabbing their mobile devices, looking for alternative flights, calling people, texting people. Uh, a couple uh, people I heard were tweeting that, you know, this airline sucks because they didn't have jumper cables or whatever the, the problem was. And it was basically, I think they had to turn the fuel valve on, which is pretty simple. You'd think they'd do that in advance, though, wouldn't you? But, but so that, that's a dependency. If people didn't have that ability, if we didn't have sort of the day-to-day -day things we depend on, this society as we know it, not just in the United States, but globally, uh -huh. would be really shaken at its core. Yeah. So the change is that we depend on this. It's no longer just something nice to have to, to buy tickets online. It's great to think about the incredible value that systems bring to the table. Uh, of course, we're all security professionals and we worry about the little things going on. And uh, two particular types of threats that have hit the press really a lot over the past few years, uh, one being the idea of uh, nation state sponsored attacks against intellectual property, some folks call the advanced persistent threat, and the other being just straight up cyber crime. Right. Cyber fraud, uh, folks having money siphoned uh, out of their accounts, especially uh, small and mid-sized businesses that aren't necessarily robust and mature in their thought process around security. How do we make sense of something as, as vast and different as a threat landscape that includes uh, the advanced persistent threat on the one hand versus straight up uh, cyber crime, Willie Sutton kinds of attacks on the other? Yeah, and it's really interesting that you bring that up, Pete, because when you start looking at the landscape we've got, Particularly, you know, and, and when I was back at the White House, there was sort of like munging all this together. So the cybercrime, credit card fraud, identity theft, the traditional crimes that are now, you know, technologies being, being used to help facilitate them has been, oh, gee, we need to, you know, like launch missiles against that, as opposed to the other end, which I call the spy versus spy. You know, nation states have been doing that ever since there were nation states. Espionage, you know, whether it goes back to the ancient uh, uh, Chinese warfare and, uh, you know, the art of warfare, the, the book that was written, it's always about espionage. But in the middle, there's a couple other pieces that I think that we lose uh, sight of. So the cybercrime, that's the law enforcement, awareness, education, crime prevention type piece. The spy versus spy or the intelligence agencies, uh, at least the good guys as far as I'm concerned, need to do a better job not only protecting our assets but also making sure that they're doing a better job exploiting the other folks. Mm -hmm. I think the distinction on that, that end though is most nations when they do espionage do not take economic espionage and turn it over to their their own companies within their countries there's sort of this unwritten rule that says if you're going to be a spy you spy for some things but you don't use it to benefit businesses and i think that's the change that we're concerned about i think right now we need to really work on what are the norms in cyberspace mm -hmm. uh, and government being as slow as, as government is and i, I know mm -hmm. firsthand I think it's a lot of this is going to be the private sector to get together and say, how do we create those norms? Uh, medical devices, I understand that one of the speakers yesterday, I just had a, a, not too long ago, a full briefing on medical devices connected to a network. Is it good, is it acceptable for a nation state when they're in a conflict to start affecting our medical devices? I'd say no. Uh, you know, financial services, I'd say no. You know, if military goes after military, which is traditional, don't get us in the civilian thing in between. We see this in urban warfare in the physical world. We need to make sure we slice and dice that in uh, the online world. Mm -hmm. So we as companies, we as individuals can sort of establish the norms to say, don't bring us in your crossfire. Mm -hmm. So the other two buckets, so you've got the norm, you've got the computer crime, you've got the spy versus spy. Uh, the other piece is the theft of intellectual property, which is huge. That's where it comes to us. Uh, you mentioned the, the security professionals and the evolution of, of many of you in the room here. Remember, it was just about the technology. And many of you that are e executives in the companies, you know, I, 20 years ago, I would have never believed that would, would have a position like a CISO as a VP level corporate officer. But look at it now. You actually get to have your voice out there. So it's a matter of convincing the companies that security is good for business. The illustration I like to use is the, is the power system. I've never seen an electrical company get paid if that meter is not spinning. 
or in the case of today with the digits moving on the, on the smart meters. But basically, it's good for business. So that's what the piece we need to focus on is how do we stop the bleeding by convincing people we're losing it and the companies need to really pay attention. It's fascinating that you talk about sort of changing the rules of engagement in, in our traditional understanding of state on state uh, kinds of uh, conflict. And we, we talk more about, uh, as, you, as you moved on, you talk more about things like critical infrastructure right. and where that might fit into the, uh, the realm of, uh, of our discussion. How do we, uh, I know recently you wrote uh, an op-ed piece for New York Times on this concept of cyber war. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what, uh, for those folks who, ha who didn't read it, uh, some of the things that, that you talked about and, and how we push forward with our understanding of that in, the, uh, in our industry, in our profession? Yeah, it's really interesting and it goes back to when I was at the White House the first time, the buzzword was cyber terrorism. And we had a bunch of CEOs come in, which is traditionally the way you try to, to affect change. And, and they would come in, and there was this big pitch, and I forget who it was that was in, a, in, the, in the White House talking about cyber terrorism, cyber terrorism, cyber terrorism. And one of the CEOs said, wait a minute, if it's a terrorism issue, that's a government problem. You know, the law enforcement community, the intelligence community, the Department of Defense, I run a business that I sell widgets. So why should I be worried about cyber terrorism? Mm -hmm. Um, and so what we say and the words we use really, really matter. And many of you know, you walk in and say, viruses are bad, viruses are bad, and we have to do this, and nothing happens. It sort of impacts the way they invest in, in security. So we really have to be precise. So when you start talking about cyber warfare, it sounds good. I mean, it's a good recruitment commercial on television to get people to join that, that have technical skills and may not want to throw the medicine ball 40 miles, but sure can you know, hammer on a keyboard. But when you come down to it, you look at war in the bigger sense, one of the first things any conflict looks to do is affect command and control. Back a zillion years ago, they used to try to intercept the runner going from the front lines back to the generals in the back to say, we need more troops. So what they do is they stop and kill them and, and keep that command and control from taking place. And moving forward, you know, they climb telephone poles and clip the telegraph wires. In modern times, they bomb satellite systems or they do all these other things. So, so when you look at use of cyber in conflict or wartime, it's not a war unto itself. It's a mechanism by which you conduct a conflict. Mm -hmm. And what happens, you use the term and people automatically think, hey, gee, we're in a cyber warfare. You know, the, the term was that we're losing. And once again, I reject that because I see the things that you all are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and how can we be losing if it still works? Yeah, we have battles that we're fighting like crazy that you know, we say, boy, we, you know, we lost the, the web server for the last five hours and it's back up and running now, but the bottom line is don't mm -hmm. conflate you know, uh, some of these activities with warfare because there's difference. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting uh, from that perspective of, of the notion of cyber war, it seems like Certainly, the U.S. government has gotten really actively uh, involved in uh, legislation surrounding how we protect ourselves, how we protect our country. This is where that crossover occurs from this, you know, nation on nation stuff to right. the individual level. Uh, there was uh, some recent legislation that sort of got that got squashed as a as a bill. I'm curious, uh, especially from your position as having worked in the White House, uh, what your feeling is on the types of legislation you see coming down the pipeline and how you interact with Congress at a, at a very personal level. Uh, can you give us some inside scoop on that? Yeah, it was interesting because uh, the legislation that we proposed in May of, of now 2011, uh, when I first got there, there were something like 13 proposed pieces of legislation across 15 some odd <laughs> committees. Homeland Security was ex exerting jurisdiction at Congress, and then the, the Armed Services Committee was doing it, and the science technology folks, and it was all over the, the place. So I went up, spent some time with members in, in both parties on both uh, uh, sides of the, uh, the Congress, and said, listen, you know, we need to really come together in this. We all recognize there's risk out there, but what we want to do is look at something more consolidated. Uh, don't piecemeal this thing to death, because one, it's confusing to everybody. It's like, what, state, 47 states have data breach notification laws, so we as citizens really don't understand what our rights are, depending upon which state we live in or where the data resides. But even worse, how do you run a business that way? when you're trying to protect privacy under 47 different uh, uh, schemas that you deal with. 
So saying to Congress, we want to simplify this. So we spent well over a year with departments and agencies. Each one of those went to their private sector counterparts and said, what are the things that we really need Congress to do that we can't do as businesses, that the executive branch just can't do by fiat in some form or fashion, whether it's a OMB directive or it's an executive order. And so it was a pretty narrow uh, uh, swath of things. Increase penalties or add computer crimes to organized crime. Believe it or not, the Racketeering Influence Cor Corrupt Act, or RICO as we know it, didn't include cybercrime because when it was written, it was more about the mafia and all these other things. Uh, so included in there. Also have enhanced penalties for those that affect critical infrastructure. Yeah, computer crime, uh, stealing credit cards is a bad thing, but causing electricity to be shut off or a water treatment plant to be shut down, that's a major issue. So those are things we really needed Congress to do. Uh, making sure that we had funding for training and things like that to do, as, as I call it, the cross-pollination program, taking experts from private sector, giving them the ability to do a year or two with a government agency so they can bring the private sector perspective into the, into the department or agency, but also take somebody from there and show them what life is in, in the real world, as I call it. Because there's a perspective, and, and many of you hear this all the time, private sector's got all the money in the world. Why don't they just rip out the infrastructure and replace it? If we could, we would. Mm -hmm. But we can't. So this would be a good, and that was something we, we looked for in legislation. Information sharing, very, very critical. Uh, I mean, both from my previous uh, private sector life to the government life, there's always this, the intelligence agencies, the law enforcement agencies knows about some of these threats. They can give us that information so we can reduce the likelihood of us becoming a victim. Why aren't they sharing with us? Well, it's classified. Mm -hmm. And there's a 1940-some-odd law that actually prohibits that sharing of information. Mm -hmm. So turn that around. That was a legislative thing that we were working on. The most controversial was, and the term we use all the time, was core critical infrastructure, which is to be defined. Mm -hmm. And that's how do we get some level of assurance that the lights will stay on, the water will flow, all the things that we depend on under massive cyber intrusions. You know, we talk about nation states developing all kinds of malware, which is really, really scary. Uh, but how do we make sure we have some level of assurance and some attestation from companies that run and operate the critical infrastructure? That has been the real sticky point mm -hmm. because it's been interpreted as government regulation on and telling private sector how to run their, their business, which was not ISO 27,000 series, uh, NIST guidelines, which most of us strive to, to uh, uh, work under, are the things that we're looking to either uh, look to, to work under, not Homeland Security create this new set of regulations, which it be a, a, you know, just a doomsday scenario trying to do that. And they're smart people, but they don't know how all of our individual enterprises run. So that was the sticky point. So what's now, it's been reduced where I think that's off to the side, uh, looking at the information sharing as being the main piece of it. And I think that itself uh, has a likelihood of moving forward at some time in the future. So as we navigate uh, among these entities, the, uh, the government entity, of course, our corporate environment, and even us as citizens, uh, it seems like there's so many uh, both responsibilities, but also, uh, on the other hand, potentially rights that we have to navigate through. Can you uh, give me some insight into the nature of trust in our environment and, and how to work through uh, the various dis uh, uh, elements of, of, of trust? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, Pete, because one of the things that when we talk about security, often push off to the side is that privacy and, and the freedom of expression things that, that we, you know, this is what we live on. You know, you talk about getting tweets in there. We have the ability to do that. But if you remember last year during the Arab Spring, I mean, actually they shut down the communications mechanism, the internet, the, uh, the mobile phones, the IP, you know, internet uh, uh, through Twitter and Facebook and everything. So we really cherish that. So how do you sort of balance security and privacy at the same time and build that trust? And that's what it's about. Uh, one of the things that, that we did, which I, I hope many of you uh, uh, either read or, or in some, many cases were a part of, this National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. Identity management is something we really need to leapfrog ahead on. You know, the vast majority of us, myself included, I'd say probably 95% of my accounts still using user ID and passwords. I use a strong one because, you know, that's what we do as, as security professionals. 
but basically, you know, most people don't. Many of the things that we care about don't even enforce strong passwords. So it says, yes, you should use, you know, upper lowercase characters, stand on your foot with a beer on your head and, and when you log in, but they don't enforce it. And so look at how do we build trust by getting better identity management, use OT one-time passwords on mobile devices, uh, USB sticks, smart cards, whatever the technology may be, and it has to accept multiple identities, mm -hmm. uh, accept multiple technologies, but that's the way we build the trust. Mm -hmm. That gives us better integrity at the, at the first level, which is the, uh, the authentication mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. The other piece that, that, to build that trust is we really have to do a better job about development of software and firmware. I don't know how many of you uh, uh, this morning saw the article, if, if indeed true, of some of the Broadcom chips in mobile devices. I mean, we've been talking about that for years. The industrial control systems in our, in our critical infrastructure, they were designed for a world that A, wasn't connected to a network or network connected to the internet. And so that's why we're having some of the problems we have. When we look at mobile devices and the ability to commit a DDoS attack because of the embedded chips in the device, it's not as if, as if you can write a patch for that. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing we need to build up trust is really have a focus based on security requirements developed by the professionals in this room mm -hmm. to say, here's the way we need software developed, here's the way we need firmware, and here's the things we need to do to, to really build a level of trust mm -hmm. in the system itself. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Jason from uh, Twitter for uh, leading me into this next question, which is a function of, you know, how do we as uh, enterprises get along with uh, uh, suppliers that may be right. international? Certainly last week there was the Huawei incident. You talk about Broadcom. Uh, nowadays, nowadays we're outsourcing lots of manufacturing to many different states and all, and, and we can't always tell the difference between an a nation state as the actor or the threat actor in our environment and just some corporate espionage. Is there, do you have any guidance for how a, an enterprise can, can think along those lines when they're worried about uh, uh, nation state kinds of threats? Yeah, and that's probably one of the most difficult things that we, we deal with. I know we did a lot of work on just the supply chain from the telecom industry. Uh, and it boiled down to the three pieces that, that we looked at. Number one, the technical analysis of telecom equipment. You know, how do you go in there when you're looking at, at, at boards that have, in many cases, 500, 600 chips on there? Uh, the ability to know, is that an extra chip that's designed to conduct espionage every time they see the word top secret come through, they shoot, ship it off somewhere, or under, you know, a certain set of conditions, you can send the kill command out there. It's technically extremely difficult, if not impossible, to do that. So we have to build some business processes about how that technology is developed. Uh, whether it's sampling that we do out there, whether there's, there's tight controls on what's put on, how it's put on, and somewhere of validation, even some uh, hashing values to say this is all there is in there. These are things that we, we have to look at from the technical piece. The government has tremendous expertise, particularly in the intelligence community, but there's tremendous technology and, and tremendous capabilities in the private sector. We really need to merge them tool to because I don't care where it's built. I don't care where the code is written. I don't care where the machine is put together. It's what's in the machine and how the machine operates that, that I think we really need to care about. So the first level, what are the technical things that we can do to validate that things are good? The second thing, and, and once again, specifically on the telecom, what are the trade issues relative to this? I mean, we hear a lot about in, in the telecom that some countries have actually funded uh, some of the competitive to, to other companies around the world funded them in violation of WTO rules. Well, let's investigate those. Let's see if it's real. If it's real, let's take action. Because if it's costing us jobs, if it's costing us uh, uh, revenue, it's costing us the ability to build our infrastructure securely, well, we need to go after that. That's what those sort of organizations, as bureaucratic as they may be, what they're, what they're all about. The third thing, and I think this is the most important one that affects all of us, and I'll use the wireless environment. I think most of us have either pretty close to or have migrated to the 4G environment. I don't know how many of you are talking about 5G, but you know, some of us are. You know, what will 5G bring? Well, big, better capabilities, uh, higher speeds, more vulnerabilities. But if you look at the 5G environment, I think those that are gonna be competitive building that, that generation of equipment, they're the same ones we're dealing with today. So what do we do looking to build 6G? What are the friendly nations? Are we working with Japan, Germany, UK, uh, 
Canada, Australia, to build the companies that are going to build that next generation that's more trusted. Mm -hmm. Because if we indeed have a level of concern about where a, where a particular piece of equipment is manufactured or designed, the code is written, well, let's be competitive. We have seeded a lot of that from the, uh, the Western worlds, the economic basis. We have said, okay, somebody else go build it and we'll buy it because it's cheap. We really need to get back in the game and be competitive. And the way we do that is, you know, the entrepreneurs, the, the startups all around the country, the universities that are doing great research that can say, hey, fund this project, and we move forward. That's the thing that will really sort of reduce the risk that we've got in that whole supply chain issue. So I want to turn the tables a little bit. We, we always talk about and think about advanced persistent threat in nations that are uh, worrisome to us as uh, most of us being American citizens. But certainly we have folks in the audience and members of ISSA, uh, 135, 140 chapters around the world. Uh, we don't always know who to trust. Did, did you get involved in the White House at all with uh, the US as a threat actor to other uh, countries that were? Uh, yeah. The, the, the bully on the block was the term I once heard, uh, uh -huh. bully on the block in cyberspace. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I guess that goes by earlier sort of uh, uh, sarcastic comment about the things that I worry about. So we have enough people out there writing pieces of malware that affect everything that we do, critical infrastructure, our own personal privacy, all these other pieces out there. I understand that governments need to do that, particularly defense organizations, because the Defense Department, and whether it's ours, the uh, Japanese Defense Forces, uh, the Self-Defense Forces, the uh, uh, Australian Royal Air Force, all these organizations, they now depend on the Internet as much as most, most of us do. Here in the United States, Transcom is basically FedEx and UPS. And so there's a level of, of dependency that's out there. But on the same token, the things that you would write to protect yourselves can be turned around in a heartbeat and used as malicious tools and, and in, in the case of the, the term that's used all the time, cyber weapons. So we really have to be cautious. Uh, this may seem silly, and, and I apologize to, to colleagues and friends the way I put this. I mentioned earlier Sun Tzu, the art of war. Uh, and I, over the years, I get bored and I have it on my, one of my mobile devices and I read some of these things. And there was one talking about the use of fire, which I thought was cool. So I sort of twisted around, and this is my version of that. Using fire in a conflict is only effective if, A, you have nothing of your own that's flammable, or B, what you have is flammable is irrelevant to what your needs are. And the same thing in cyberspace. If you're writing malware that's going to go out and affect systems, you better sure hope that that doesn't get modified to where it can be used against you and where you're most vulnerable, and we know firsthand how vulnerable we are, or that it, whatever it affects is going to be irrelevant. And I can't think of anything in any of the malware that's been suspected developed by any government, including our government, that hasn't been turned around, modified, reverse engineered and now launched on the rest of the world. So we all now have to deal with not only the traditional threats, but also stuff that we create ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we really, almost like in, in, in the biological uh, uh, world, uh, we really have to start focusing on if we need to build these things, how do we do it in a more controlled manner that basically we're not going to be sitting here someday and say, oops, sorry, we just created a really, really big problem that we developed ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now you were in the White House during the Stuxnet incident. Can you give us a sense, give us a little inside scoop here on the strangest or most interesting reaction that you uh, uh, were uh, aware of based on some of the accusations coming in from the press and the media and how the uh, government was responding? Yeah, I'm sorry, Senator. I have no independent recollection oh, of those events. Darn it. <laughs> I was going to try to say. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I get that right? Let me get the card. Yeah, that's We right. all know about Stuxnet, but what about that other one, yeah, that yeah. other one you were going to tell yeah. us about? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and obviously there, there's, there's just things that, that are not appropriate sure, to, sure. to talk about. But the bottom line is that goes. A guy to the, can try, right? A yeah, that's correct. Try. But, yeah, but that yeah. goes to the key point. Uh -huh. Irrespective of where it's developed, when mm -hmm. these things can be turned around in a heartbeat and hit us mm -hmm. where we're most vulnerable, mm -hmm. I mean, that's something we really have to start mm -hmm. thinking about. And the business process, and I, and I call it that, to make a decision that there is a dramatic enough need there's enough national security and public safety need that we need to do something 
that may be used against us, we better have all the things in place mm -hmm. to make sure, if indeed it is, that we're protected against it. That's sort of creating that inflammable barrier, right. the things we need. I, of course, mentioned the Stuxnet incident slightly facetiously, but certainly as we look at the legislation coming down the pike and we read what's going on in the press uh, coming from our, our government leaders, it's sometimes scary, isn't it? Uh, the perspectives that folks have who aren't necessarily as uh, seasoned as we are in, in understanding the nature of the technology and the nature of the threat. Uh, you, of course, had to deal with that day in and day out. Is there, how do we as a profession do uh, a better job or what can we do to ensure that our uh, legislators really understand the types of things that we're concerned about and the, the issues at hand from a more objective, rational uh, basis? Yeah, and I think I'll, I'll start at the top, the large enterprises that oftentimes have government relations people in Washington, D.C. I know uh, many of my colleagues, including uh, one of my dearest friends, Mary Ann Davidson, they would take her up there so she could educate those people. And as we know, uh, as, as great as she is, there was no hold, hold barred on that one. It was like, <laughs> here's the way it is. Uh, that's really important. Mm -hmm. So the, the big companies that have government relations, if they're not taking you as a security professional up there, start knocking on their door because that's the only way we're going to get the leaders, particularly in the congressional side, educated. The other way you can do that is through your local representatives and, and particularly even though there's a, everybody's distracted with the election going on now, after the elections are over and the dust settles, Go to your local representative's offices and say, listen, as security professionals, here's the things, A, we're concerned about. B, here's the things that we think government can do to help or get out of our way. And the mm -hmm. third thing is, here's the things that you can do uh, uh, locally, whether it's a chamber of commerce, whether it's just you know, representatives you know, coming to meetings like this and, and hearing from the professionals. That's sort of the, the local level. The other thing is for small, medium-sized businesses that don't have that government relations folks in D.C., the, the other term, by the way, is called lobbyists. I'm being generous when I say government relations folks. <laughs> uh, but those that don't have that, there's nothing to preclude you at all from using the strength of ISSA mm -hmm. uh, and say, listen, we're going to go up there and, and take a half a dozen of our uh, seasoned veterans here, both uh, uh, large corporations, small corporations, startups, researchers and do sort of a set up a deal because the congressional members love that when they have a delegation coming in it's going to spend you know a day with them whether it's in mass or whether it's individual meetings you can really target that particularly those now now senator joe lieberman is, is retiring after this year and he was sort of one of the champions susan collins from maine was another one john rockefeller was another one i mean we had a whole bunch of people that really cared but what happens when they only hear one piece of it, and, and believe me, I was, a, in many cases, a sole voice up there because, you know, we've worked together. We know what's out there and trying to convey that, no, it's not what they're saying over here. This is the way that works in the real world. Getting that, they really like to hear that, and it, it, they, it does influence their thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that I think we can really step up our game into making sure that we're not sitting there in a corner going, boy, they're really, really, they don't get it, do they? Mm -hmm. Let's make sure they get it. As we wrap up a little bit of our conversation here, uh, I'd like to point to the audience, and uh, we need some advice, right? Somewhere sitting out here is our next cybersecurity czar, uh, at least for the United States, perhaps for other countries from our uh, international attendees. What kinds of advice do you have for her on the... Uh, types of things <laughs> she should be doing inside the beltway just to get along. How do we get along day to day with our legislators as, as cybersecurities are? Uh, give us some advice. Yeah, and, and I think the biggest thing is being able to listen mm -hmm. and negotiate. Uh, and, and I think whether it was the legislation, whether it was this uh, defense industrial pilot program that we ran, uh, at, at my level, we, we function at the, at the deputy secretary level with all the departments and agencies. Bringing them together, I mean, I don't know how many times I brought them in for a private lunch at the West Wing dining room and just smooth them. I, and, and I don't mean that in a very, very positive and respectful manner, sitting down and saying, you as the de facto COO for the departments and agencies, cybersecurity is your responsibility. And that's one of the things that, that whoever she may be is to be able to sit there and say, okay, let's get that personal relationship built and then we, we expand that. So if you have five deputies that you have developed a relationship and you get in a deputies meeting, they're your partners, they're your friends. 
They help move the ball forward and get away from some of the, the traditional, no, we can't do this, or it's too difficult, or I don't want to talk about it because it's, it's, it's too much of a challenge. Mm -hmm. So that skill the, the, and the knowledge of how the system really works, I think are the mm -hmm. two biggest things that can really make someone successful and really execute some of what I think were great strategies that, that the team put together, uh, the team at the White House, the private sector folks, uh, and, and I'll close that thought on sort of building things with a quote that was attributed to Althea Gibson, uh, you know, the famous tennis star, that said, none of us can accomplish anything without the help of others. Mm -hmm. And I look back at what was accomplished, and there's still a lot to do, and it was done because we all did it together. Mm -hmm. And so whoever that person is, if they have that concept that they're not going to be the, the agent of change, it's going to be all of us together, that's a recipe mm -hmm. for success. Mm -hmm. And I know you uh, are, are running to catch a flight, strangely, in post-retirement Howard <laughs> Schmidt world, uh, and they're waiting on you for the jumper cables. But uh, tell us a little <laughs> or the bit. Fuse. The final question: yeah. What are you up to? Uh, you're you're retired from the White House, uh, in theory retired, but I understand you're uh, a jet setter in, in lots of different ways. Uh, give us a sense for what kinds of initiatives you're working on now. Yeah, I, I think the the way to sum it up is I'm trying to actually live the things that, that we all care about. Making sure uh, I'm, I'm with meeting with three different governments in the Nordic region the first part of next week. Making sure the governments understand there's a role and responsibility the government has, but the vast majority of the work is, needs to be done in the private sector. Making sure that they understand that the security professionals that are in their governments and their private sector companies, that basically get the support that they need. Uh, working on some corporate boards, uh, for the most part security companies, but also meeting with with CEOs and board of directors of, of major companies to sit down and say, yeah, this is not something that you must have. I mean, this is something you need to have on every board meeting on the agenda. Bring your security uh, executives in, bring people in, but this is an agenda item just like your quarterly financial report will be. Mm -hmm. uh, then the other piece is, is, is stuff like this, is just having the opportunity to meet with those that really do the real work out there. And, and, and I can learn a lot from, from the folks in this audience. Great, great. Uh, folks, it, it never ceases to amaze me. I've spoken to Howard a number of times through the years and always new and, and great, better insight about the way the world works. So let's give uh, Howard a great round of applause. Thank you very much for coming through. Appreciate it, Howard. You're awesome, like usual. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you.